Welcome everyone and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Ian and I'm part of an independent facilitation team that's helping um, the city and create TO with engagement on uh, this uh, 2444 Eglinton East site. I'll say a bit more about our role and in a few minutes uh, or just moments, I'm gonna turn it over to, to councillors Thompson and Crawford in a moment. But before I do that, I just wanna share a land acknowledgement on behalf of Create TO in the city. And I, I'm honored to give this land acknowledgement. It's, it's one way that settler descendants and non-Indigenous Canadians are able to offer our proper respect to Indigenous people and allies and supporters of them on Turtle Island. Uh, I personally was born and grew up in the city that's currently called Toronto. Uh, my parents were both born in Southern Ontario and their heritage goes back to Poland on one side, uh, my father's side, uh, which you might tell if you saw my, my last name, uh, and my mother's side goes back to Scotland and Italy. Um, and the land acknowledgement is really intended to be a reminder to us all and uh, to be mindful of the treaties uh, that were signed and are still in place here and the peoples that lived here long before us. Uh, the 2444 Eglinton East lands are covered by Treaty 13 and, the tradition, and they're the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the, the Anishinaabeg, and the Wendat peoples. And we know that today Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And I encourage you wherever you are to learn more about the traditional territory that you're in, the treaties that are signed there and the people who are important there. So with that said, I'm now gonna turn it over to Deputy Mayor and Councillor Michael Thompson to begin. And then I'm following Councillor Thompson, uh, Councillor Crawford, I'll turn it over to you for any additional other remarks. So uh, Councillor Thompson, over to you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening, uh, Ian, and good evening, everyone. And good evening to members of the community. I'm uh, delighted to join my colleague, Councillor Crawford, who is on the south side of Eglinton, and obviously the, the staff from CREATE-TO and uh, planning staff that are with us this evening. But more importantly, I'm, I'm delighted to join members of the community to learn um, about the proposed uh, development at 2444 Eglinton Avenue East uh, in the area of uh, Kennedy Road and, uh, and Eglinton. Um, members of the community, I think it's extremely important in terms of our understanding that there is a tremendous issue with respect to shortage of housing in the city of Toronto. We have some 80,000 people who are on waiting lists with respect to our Toronto community housing. We have uh, thousands of others who are actually waiting to get housed. And then we have thousands of people who are actually homeless in our city and we're spending an inordinate amount of money in order to house them. Um, in the um, essay, social housing and, and uh, administration, we're spending almost $1.2 billion with respect to short term solutions in terms of shelters and other uh, accommodations, such as hotels and so on, to accommodate residents in the city of Toronto. We know that this solution, that situation is not in terms of the long term um, feasible to sustain. And so we have to find ways and means to address the issues and the shortage of housing in the city of Toronto. What we are talking about is utilizing Toronto's um, uh, space and uh, working with partners and through our agencies, create TO and our planning team to address the issue. We know it's extremely important to you as well. We also know that you have concerns in the, uh, about the potential impact that could happen as a result of development, whether or not it's traffic, whether or not it's enough uh, space for amenities and so on, and a host of others and so on. I'm hoping that through this meeting this evening, you will have ample information to help you with respect to the questions that you will have of staff, as well as um, you know, um, getting more information uh, the uh, information that's been sent out is, is very um, informative, but certainly not informative enough. And that's the reason why we're hosting this meeting this evening to provide you with more detailed information and to also hear from you to answer the questions that you have. Um, if your questions are not answered this evening, I'm sure the staff will get back to you in collaboration with my office in terms of responding. I haven't taken a particular position with respect to this particular development in this application as part of a process. And I use the term application advisable because I know that there's a process that the city is going to go through. How will this site be developed? Who will be developing it? And the purpose for the development, of course, is to provide um, housing for um, some of your neighbors, some of your friends, uh, perhaps your grandkids, perhaps um, 
a, a, you know, a cousin, a, a relative. And so this is about ensuring that we provide space for people. And this is not a situation to create an adverse condition for our community where we're going to bring, uh, you know, any cr criminal elements and other uh, concerns that you may have. I'm hoping through this particular process, you will actually learn and garner uh, information as well as having your questions answered. So I'm looking forward to the presentation and I'm delighted that you're with us this evening. And I look forward to uh, hearing more about this particular application. So I'm happy that you're with us. I know that you are obviously safe because you're with us because we're dealing with some very difficult situations in this city. COVID, it's, it's a global phenomenon, global problem. We're all working through this. So I thank you very much for being here and I thank you for your patience. I look forward to hearing your questions and look forward to working with my colleague and city staff in terms of addressing your concerns. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to you, Ian. Hey, thanks, and Councillor Crawford, over to you. Thank you very much, Ian, and I thank you very much, uh, Michael and Deputy Mayor, for coming out tonight. Um, and, and welcome everybody to the conversation tonight about a proposal or an application that is being worked on at this present time. Um, and again, recognizing that even though it is in uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson's um, side of the ward, I don't really look, and I don't think a lot of you and a lot of the people on the line look at Eglinton as a dividing line. In fact, I look at it as an entire community. Um, and I look at what happens north of Eglinton, south of Eglinton as one large community, and it has impacts on either side, north or south. So, uh, privileged to be here tonight. Um, as uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson mentioned, uh, the priority of affordable housing in the city uh, is uh, is severe, is, is is major, especially with the challenges we've had over the last year with, with the pandemic. Um, and the City of Toronto is looking at many opportunities to look at how do we address affordable housing. One of them, of course, uh, with, is with Housing Now. Um, and you're going to be hearing tonight uh, a proposal um, for an application that is being worked on right now, as I've mentioned. Um, I did want to say I have uh, had the privilege, in fact, of um, working on two of the first Housing Now projects in the City of Toronto, one on Warden Avenue uh, and one on Victoria Park. Still going through the planning process, but uh, they, that process started about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, so I've had an opportunity to have conversations with people um, in those communities about the, you know, the priority of affordable housing and, and the, the normal kind of process when you're looking at applications and the impact it has on community. Um, but they were very, um, and I think a lot of the staff uh, on tonight were part of those conversations. Uh, but it's important that we reach out to you, the community, to inform you of, of what the application is and to ensure that you have every opportunity to ask questions, uh, voice concerns, um, and really be knowledgeable on what is before you as a, as a proposal. Um, so I'm looking again, looking forward again to having a conversation with you tonight, listening uh, very carefully. Um, ultimately, uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, uh, as the ward councillor, has to determine his uh, support or not, depending on you know how things go. Uh, but it will be reaching full council. I'm a councillor um, uh, as well, and I'll be looking at making decisions myself. Uh, but the community is a very big part of that process, and I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Crawford and Deputy Mayor Thompson. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, first uh, give a quick introduction to the other uh, people that have joined us on screen. Uh, they are a subset of the broader team that is also with us and, and some of whom you may hear from later. Uh, but this is the, the team that's gonna be providing a bit of an overview. So from the city, uh, from city planning, we have Annalie and Jeffrey, if you both wanted to maybe just give a wave. Um, and then we also have Valesa from the Housing Secretariat. Um, from Create TO, we have Jason, who can just give a wave there. Uh, and then from the consultant team, the design team, we have David and Scott, um, who just gave waves as well. And then finally, from, from our Swern Inc. team, you see Matthew uh, on screen as well, uh, who is here to help us in the, uh, both with the technology and, and the in facilitation as well. So um, as I said, there are many, many others that are, are here, um, and I currently have a attendee list of about 93, uh, which is great. It means we, we've got lots of uh, people here, and I'll, um, we will uh, create lots of time and space to hear from you, as the, both the councillor and the deputy mayor said. This is really our opportunity to hear from you, um, and I'll talk about how that's going to work um, in more detail once we get to that part of the discussion. Um, but I did want to say one last thing about our role, which is that so our sworn team, so Matthew and I are here as third party process stewards. 
What that means is we're here to help facilitate and document the discussion, but we are not here to take a position on on this project or to advocate for any particular outcome. We're really here to help steward the process. And so in that capacity, we'll be taking lots of very detailed notes over the course of the discussion, both your questions as well as the responses that the project team gives, as well as any feedback or advice that you have to share with CreateTO and the city as, as, uh, um, as this meeting moves forward. Um, we are also, you may have noticed, recording the meeting. Um, and uh, the create what CreateTO does is, is they post that on their website after afterwards. So just so you know that the meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the website um, within a couple of days. You just have to put some um, do some uh, minor work to it. But uh, if you miss part of the meeting or if you want to watch it again, you'll be able to do that. Um, we will also be typing up a summary. So if you prefer not to, to rewatch the meeting, uh, there will be a mechanism for you to review the key things that came out of the discussion as well. Um, the the one thing I will say in terms of mechanics is after the presentation and when we get to the questions, we are going to um, make all of you from the, the community that has has showed up to participate. Uh, you don't need to worry about the technology other than to say that we're going to do something in the back end that gives you the ability to turn on your camera and microphone so that you can also occupy a rectangle on the screen. And we find that makes these virtual meetings as, as difficult as they are a bit more human and a bit more like a, a normal face-to-face -face meeting. So nothing on that for now, but just to let you know that you will have that opportunity um, uh, in the next, uh, just under an, an hour or so. So in terms of the agenda, I'm just gonna put that on screen and review the both the purpose and how the uh, we're planning to to use the, the time tonight. So as soon as I'm finished, um, we're, I'm going to turn it over to the project team to give a presentation. As I said, it's going to be about 40 minutes. Might uh, won't go longer. Uh, and at uh, once they're done, we'll open the floor first to questions that you have, and then discussion. And I'll share the discussion questions with you now, just as a quick reminder, um, and to so you have them in the back of your minds as as the presentation goes. Which is, if there's anything that you like about this proposed design and program objectives for the site that you're going to see. If there's any additions or changes to the proposed design or program objectives to the site, um, and if so, what are those proposed changes? And finally, if there's any other comments. So if your feedback, if you came to say something specifically that doesn't fit into either of those first two questions, we, we want to hear that too. Um, so pretty simple in terms of an agenda. I, at about 8.55, we'll begin a wrap up uh, and next steps, and then we'll adjourn no later than nine o'clock so that uh, so you can get to your evening. So that's it in terms of the uh, mechanics. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about how the discussion is going to go when we get there. But I think for now, I'm going to turn it over to Annalie to share the presentation. So Annalie, over to you. Thank you very much, Ian. I'll just wait until the presentation comes on screen. There we go. So again, thank you very much to all members of the community uh, who have joined us tonight. Uh, we have four parts to our presentation this evening. First, I think it's critical that we share a little bit about what the Housing Now program is and talk about the objectives of the program for this site at 2444 Eglinton in, in particular. Um, my colleague Jeffrey Sinclair from City Planning will give a planning overview. And um, then Creteo will share what a reference concept is and what that means. And then we'll discuss the project schedule and next steps. So who is here tonight? Uh, the project team for Housing Now is made up of the Housing Secretariat and Creteo and City Planning. So the Housing Secretariat is the corporate lead at the City of Toronto in charge of the Housing Now initiative. Um, and they are responsible for looking at the target for new numbers and affordability of uh, units that are brought online through the Housing Now program. City planning uh, that I'm with is the lead in updating the planning frameworks to facilitate uh, the new development. So that means things like zoning bylaws and other city approvals required to enable a new building to be constructed. And CreateTO is the city's real estate agency. So in the context of Housing Now, um, they are managing the city's real estate portfolio, helping to select the sites that are used for Housing Now and managing uh, the, the selection of new developer partners to bring these sites to reality. Next. A little bit about Housing Now. 
So Housing Now was launched by Mayor Torrey and approved at City Council in December 2018. And the key purpose of Housing Now is to use city-owned land to accelerate the development afford of affordable housing. Throughout, we're looking to maximize the public benefits that are achievable on this valuable asset, which is public land. So, of course, we're looking at affordable housing, but we're also looking at opportunities for new community facilities, uh, expansion to the city's park network, and public realm improvements. That means making the land around these sites uh, more usable for pedestrians, cyclists, and the like. All of our projects are mixed income communities uh, and mixed use. And again, the focus is locating sites that are near transit so that people can access transit and be part of the overall city network. All of our sites uh, feature enhanced consultations. So that means that where for normal development in your community, you might have one or two consultations. We consult multiple times before the development is approved. And then again, once the building is brought forward for what's called site plan approval, where you can get to see the look and feel of the building itself. The image that you can see on your screen here is the spectrum of housing affordabilities that we have in the city of Toronto. So it goes from everything from emergency shelters that Deputy Mayor Thompson referred to all the way to market home ownership. And the pictures that are colored here, you can see in red, purple, and blue are the types of housing affordability that the Housing Now program is looking at. So we don't look at all aspects of the housing, uh, the housing spectrum, but we focus on new affordable rental housing, new market rental housing, that means uh, housing that's rented at the average, uh, uh, the market rents for the city, and new home ownership housing. And Ian, can I just confirm that, oh, there we are, I can see the screen again. There are 17 sites citywide for the Housing Now program. So you can see the site at 2444 Eglinton Avenue East highlighted in yellow on your screen here. But as you can see, we have sites uh, elsewhere in Scarborough, in North York, downtown, midtown, and in Etobicoke. All of our sites are different uh, sizes and contain different programs in terms of the amount of housing. Some of them include new roads, new parklands, et cetera. So tonight you'll hear a little bit more about what we think the Housing Now site at 2444 Eglinton can support. The objectives of the program. Councillor Thompson, Deputy Mayor Thompson talked about the need for new affordable rental housing to serve uh, those who are living in the city but have challenges related to housing affordability. So the images you see on your screen are representative of real people in your neighborhood, uh, early childhood educators, retired persons, people working in construction or nurses. And these people are uh, have incomes ranging between $35,000 and $52,000 a year. But based on the rents in Toronto today, these people are paying between 37 and 83% of their income on housing, which meets no measure of affordability. And we know that these are individuals in particular who are helping us get through the crisis that the city is in today with respect to COVID-19. So we have frontline workers right now who have challenged making uh, ends meet when it comes to rent because of the, uh, the range or the, the spread between the incomes they make and the cost of rent in the city of Toronto. 2444 Eglinton Avenue East is an important city asset. It's city land and it's something that uh, we know is very valuable. So before a developer comes on board here, we have set out some objectives for them uh, when they're developing at this site. So firstly, understanding the uh, need for housing affordability and an increase in new affordable housing in the city, we want to maximize the opportunity for new units. At this site, we'll be seeking at least one third of all new units to be new affordable rental. We also understand that people with larger households and people with children have challenges dealing with finding the right size of, uh, housing unit to uh, support the varied, the varied needs of their larger households. So we're looking for family sized units that meet what the city's guidelines are around growing up, which is um, providing family oriented buildings, uh, units and amenities in, in tall buildings. We care very deeply that this project meets the city's greens, Toronto Green Standard uh, at the tier two version three level. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as the presentation continues. We also understand that rental housing needs to be 
providing um, accessible units. So 20% of all new units will be barrier free and all common areas will be barrier free. If you know the site, you know that there are challenges related to accessing the broader street network. So we will be looking particularly at improving the public realm around the site and increasing the connectivity to the site. And finally, it's very important that we provide as much open space as possible for use of, by the residents in private amenity and green space surrounding the site and for access by the community. I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey now to talk about the site context. Thank you very much, Annalee. Um, uh, once again, I'm Jeffrey Sinclair. I work in city planning as well with Annalee. Um, and I'm just gonna provide you hopefully with a very brief overview of the uh, context and the planning framework. Um, I'll be followed up by uh, a presentation by CreateTO, uh, Jason Chen, as well as um, David Collins from Ziedler Architects and Scott Torrance from Forec Landscape Architecture. So um, the site context, um, <clears throat> as you can see on this slide, uh, has some uh, very notable components, namely the transit um, oriented uh, context and the existing physical context that I want to highlight here. So we have the, in terms of physical context um, that's notable here is the hydro corridor lands to the northwesterly end of the site and the North Service Road and Eglinton overpass. Uh, that we want to pay uh, particular attention to through the review of a future development application. Um, it is worth noting as well that uh, there's a fair bit of transit related or um, context that is worth noting. Uh, we have the Stouffville goal line uh, to the east, immediately to the east of the lands, as well as the Scarborough RT. Um, we have the Ken uh, new Kennedy Station, a new GO Station entrance buildings um, on the Kennedy Station uh, lands. You, you will have noticed that there's a fair bit of construction occurring um, on those lands if you live in the immediate area. Um, <clears throat> there is um, also the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, which is soon to be um, completed. And then obviously we have uh, the line two subway um, that connects um, and uh, that is a, an extension of the Bloor um, Danforth um, line. So in terms of uh, the subject site, um, what I want to highlight here is that uh, we have a 2.86 hectare, sorry, acre site, approximately 11,610 square meters. Uh, and, and in terms of the site dimensions along the southerly edge, uh, we have about 179 meters. Um, as you can see dimensioned here on this plan, uh, we have 228 meters along the northwesterly edge of the site and 130 meters dimensioned along the Scarborough RT line. Now in, ter in terms of the subject site context as well, the image at the top is a panoramic view um, standing generally at the west of the site looking east with the hydro corridor that you can just see at the top left of the image, the parking lot in the foreground, as well as tall buildings to the east and a, v and, um, a little bit of a view of the overpass in this image as well. The image at the bottom is um, panoramic as well and is a view standing generally at the east end of the site looking west with the vacant auto repair place um, in that shot. Again, the parking lot and in the distance, the hydro corridor along the northwesterly end. Um, just in terms of some additional views, um, again, standing at the south end of the site um, along the service road, looking north at the site, um, you can see much of the context I noted in uh, just the previous comment. And um, <clears throat> at the south end of the site, looking further south, towards the overpass in the foreground. Um, you can, you can uh, see that relatively prominently and we have the existing Kennedy Station further south and Don Montgomery Community Center. Now in terms of parks and open spaces, there are a range of parks within a 10 to 15 minute walk of the site. 
Uh, we have Treverton Park, uh, which is a, a little bit of a challenge to access from the site, uh, which we acknowledge. And we also have uh, Glen Ravine Park, which is a little bit of a distance away as well, as well, a, a, along with a number of parks on the south side of Eglinton Avenue. Um, there are barriers that exist to accessing park space. Um, and as Anna Lee had noted, uh, we'll be looking for a future development to address access to um, future uh, parks and open space areas. Now, in terms of community services and facilities, um, there is a library that's um, immediately to the west of the site, the Kennedy Eglinton branch. There are a couple of schools just at the bottom of this image, um, Corvette Junior uh, Public School, as well as Midland Collegiate. There's uh, the Community Center, Don, Mon Don Montgomery. Um, there are some daycare and child care services, namely the Rainbow Village Child Care Center, which many, probably some of you would be familiar with that live in the adjacent condos. Um, and the Gilder Early Learning Child Care Center. There's also the Gatineau Corridor Recreation Trail, which um, is just north of the site leading up to the Medway. Uh, so in terms of the cycling network, uh, this slide is intended to just illustrate um, essentially the convergence of a range of cycling uh, trails and paths that uh, kind of um, uh, converge in a node um, immediately to the uh, south of the site. So that's that's important um, from a city building perspective, and I just wanted to um, to highlight that that piece. Next slide. Um, so just on cycling as well, uh, the Golden Mile community. Um, its easterly limit is approximately one kilometer west of the site along and along with other matters in the, in the fall of 2020, City Council adopted urban design guidelines, including what is shown kind of diagrammatically as the Eglinton Avenue East Streetscape concept plan. There's a little bit of a typo here that plan should be, um, uh, should say 2020. The image on the left is, is taken from the study, of course, and represents an enhanced streetscape with road widenings planned to permit tree-lined streets and comfortable spaces for pedestrians and, of course, bike lanes, as highlighted in blue. The image on the right is taken from the TTC's Eglinton Avenue East Priority Bus Implement Implementation Plan 2020 uh, for the stretch between Midland and Brimley Road and illustrates public transit improvements in the area. Now, in terms of the planning framework, um, <clears throat> the site is generally in the central uh, west end of Scarborough. Uh, it's along a higher order transit corridor on map four of our official plan, and it falls on an avenue in the official plan as well. So, we have the official plan urban structure map, and this image illustrates essentially exactly where the site is located uh, within the avenue's overlay. And in terms of a city building approach, the city anticipates that along with centers and the downtown, that avenues will accommodate um, a vast majority of the growth. Uh, the explanatory text in the OP states that, that avenues are important corridors along major streets where reurbanization is anticipated and it is encouraged to create new housing and job opportunities while improving the pedestrian environment. This section sets out policy directions for development in mixed use areas along the avenues as well, which takes me to my next slide. So you see here that the site is designated, um, it's outlined in black, a mixed use area and mixed use areas are made up of a broad range of commercial residential and institutional uses in single use or mixed use buildings, as well as parks and open spaces and utilities. Of note, um, the official plan does, although I haven't put it up on the screen, does have specific policies related to taller buildings um, and the public realm in section three of the plan. Um, and the site is zoned uh, CR zone currently and doesn't have resi residential permissions at this time. Um, shifting a little bit 
um, to another study that is relevant um, in terms of some of the previous planning work that has been undertaken uh, in the area. Though this is not city initiated, um, the Kennedy Mobility Hub is a part of the uh, framework here. So it was initiated by Metrolinx to serve as a background study for a future visioning exercise, setting the stage for additional work. Um, the Kennedy Mobility Hub is an area approximately, um, give or take 800 meters um, radius from the Kennedy station. And um, the last thing uh, that's notable here is that essentially the hub should support a vibrant multimodal transportation experience um, with the greatest intensification visioned as being closest to the station. There are a few um, city-wide guidelines that also apply. Uh, the tall buildings guidelines is one of the most important ones. Um, and it essentially um, spells out how uh, the design of tall buildings should be evaluated and carried out to ensure that tall buildings, um, they fit generally within their existing and or planned context and limit local impacts. And you see some of the considerations that we look at um, as spelled out in the tall buildings guidelines just in bullet form on the slide. In terms of the growing up uh, planning for children in vertical communities guidelines, um, they direct, uh, and this was referred to a little bit earlier, they direct how larger developments uh, might be able to accommodate um, families with children. They encourage the provision, provision of larger units and essentially um, uh, focuses on planning from the perspective of a child along with other, other considerations. Um, we have the Toronto Green Standard. Um, which comprises this, the City of Toronto's sustainable design requirements for new private and city-owned developments. And we already mentioned uh, the tier that uh, we would be looking for a future application to meet within the Toronto Green Standard. And um, lastly, the pet-friendly design guidelines um, provide guidance for new developments in a direction that is more supportive of a growing pet population, which is a reality. Um, so it considers opportunities to reduce the current burden on the public realm and provides uh, much needed pet amenities for high density residential communities. Now, in terms of future considerations, I think that I've referenced to some degree or another um, thus far in the presentation, all of these points with the exception of one comment I'll make about hydro corridors and electromagnetic field exposure. So council adopted a policy um, related to reducing electromagnetic field exposure uh, from hydro corridors. The relevant policy is of prudent avoidance to reduce childhood exposure. Uh, they are obviously one of the more vulnerable populations um, to electromagnetic fields and in adjacent, in and adjacent to hydro corridors with transmission lines. Uh, CreateTO has done some preliminary work on EMF um, electromagnetic field uh, levels. However, when applications, formal applications are received by a developer partner, um, we would require uh, a electromagnetic field management plan or study um, to evaluate uh, these, these um, items further. And with that, I'll turn it over um, to Jason to um, explore the reference concept plan and uh, for the architects to go through some of the details of what's proposed. Thanks, Jeffrey. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Jason Chen and I'm with uh, Create TO. And uh, so I'm sure many of you may be wondering, you know, what is a reference concept plan and why are we having this meeting now? So I will just try to explain all of this in this part of the presentation. So to start off, what is a reference concept plan and why are we preparing one now? So the reference concept design is a plan that uh, has been developed by Create TO and its team of consultants working very closely with city staff. <clears throat> and this reference concept shows the organizing elements of the site, including the general size, location, and heights of buildings that could be built on the site. 
including the location of amenity and open spaces. Um, some may also be wondering, why are we even having a public consultation meeting on this now? And the reason why that would be is that Create TO and the city are presenting this reference concept design to the public now to introduce how the design for this site can contribute to the city's housing now initiative and to receive some preliminary feedback on this draft concept. And feedback from the public and other stakeholders on this reference concept design will be taken into consideration to further refine the plan prior to taking this site out to market for a developer partner to zone and develop the site. Um, another question that people may have is, what is this reference concept plan going to be used for? And the final reference concept design, along with the other due diligence materials that uh, have been completed by Create TO, these will all be used as a guideline to developer partners on what the city and Create TO envisions for the site as part of our developer partner selection process. And the chosen developer partner will then use this reference concept design and the other studies completed by Create TO to inform their development applications for a formal submission to the city. And lastly, the I think a very important question will be is, will there be further public consultation on the development of this site? And the answer is most definitely yes. Um, once a rezoning application is formally submitted to the city by the um, future developer partner, there will be further public consultation meetings about the development of the site as part of the planning approvals process. Um, and these subsequent public consultation meetings will take place. We think most likely that'll happen sometime early next year. And obviously formal notice will be provided to the community in a similar fashion to um, today's meeting. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to David from Seidler Architects to present the details of the reference concept design. Thanks, Jason. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm David Collins, a partner and architect with Zeidler Architecture, and I'm pleased to be involved with this, uh, this very important project. Um, so I'd like to start off uh, by quickly reviewing the opportunities for connectivity uh, between the subject site and the surrounding and the surrounding area and transit infrastructure. Um, the subject site is highlighted with the red triangle in the upper left corner um, and the various colored lines um, around the diagram illustrate the different methods of moving to from uh, and around this and around uh, the site and the surrounding area. The solid red lines uh, illustrate the various Eggington uh, bus routes. Uh, in particular, you'll notice that the bus routes running west along Eglinton loop back onto the north service road that front um, the subject site and cross beneath the overpass um, to access the, uh, the Kennedy Station to the south. The orange solid line indicates the LRT uh, line that runs directly to the east of the site and terminates at Kennedy Station. The blue dashed lines uh, indicate how pedestrians move um, around the site. Um, and finally, the yellow arrows illustrate locations where pedestrians can cross beneath the AB Eglinton overpass. One of the main objectives of this re reference plan and for any future development proposals that result from it will be to reinforce and enhance these connections uh, through creative landscape design and public realm improvements around the subject site, which Scott Torrance from Toporek will get into a bit later in the presentation. When Beginning to explore massing options uh, and concepts for this site, we looked to some of the um, master plan concepts found within the Kennedy Mobility Hub study that Jeffrey described a bit earlier, which we thought of when considering um, appropriate tower heights for the site, uh, separating distance between towers, the relationship between um, individual towers and the related podiums, and the treatment of public realm um, surrounding the Kennedy Station uh, area illustrated on the screen. The study proposes a variety of public shapes of building shapes and sizes uh, within the study boundary with an increasing focus of height and density centered around the station itself. In particular, res residential towers ranging from 20 to 40 stories have been proposed um, to the southeast and west of the subject site, each featuring podiums of between four and six stories, um, some facing the, uh, the overlooking the, uh, the Eglinton overpass uh, found in the middle of, of the study area. The increase of height and density around the major transit hubs is in keeping with the concept of transit-oriented development, which promotes the maximization of density 
um, especially residential in areas that are within walking distance of major transit hubs, which this site would certainly um, qualify as. So this slide shows um, a conceptual site plan that is that is proposed to form the basis of the reference concept plan. The site itself um, is not particularly small, but it is triangular, which presents challenges when considering um, possible locations and orientations of, of towers. We've been working with city staff and CREATO to explore uh, a number of different strategies to maximize density on the site, um, aiming to abide by all of the tall building guidelines provide as much high quality and continuous open space at, at, um, at grade as, as, as we can, minimizing sun shadows um, on neighboring properties, and finally enhancing and activating the street frontage, street frontage along the service road in front of the site. There are defined setbacks from each of the three sides of the triangle. Um, we have a five meter front yard setback um, from the Eglinton North Service Road, a seven meter rear yard setback from the hydro corridor to the, to the Northwest, and a significant setback of, of between 20 and 30 meters um, from the rail corridor to, to the east. You'll see on the screen that we're proposing three towers on the site. Um, from, uh, starting from the west, Tower A uh, is proposed to be 22 stories. Uh, will include a four-story podium. Um, the tower plate is a maximum of 750 square meters and steps back from the podium at level four um, by a minimum of, of about three meters along Eglinton uh, North Service Road. Um, tower B, which is to the west of, of to the east of Tower A, is proposed to be 40 stories, and Tower C to the to the northwest uh, northeast is another 30 stories. Tower B and C will be connected by a podium uh, that will vary in height um, from two to two to five stories, um, and will face on to a courtyard in the center of the site. Again, all tower plates are a maximum of 750 square meters, as per the tall building guidelines, and each feature a minimum of three meter setback from each face of its associated podium. Um, between the three proposed towers, we're looking at, a proc at approximately 925 units uh, in total. Um, the, the unit mix is proposed to meet the requirement of the growing up guidelines, uh, which features more family sized units. Careful attention has been paid to ensuring that there's a sufficient uh, separation distance between each of these towers, um, and also between these towers and the surround and the surrounding existing towers. Um, You'll see, um, uh, can we go back one slide? Sorry. The plan indicates that towers A and C are located a minimum of 25 meters away uh, from the power lines that are found in the hydro corridor, which is indicated on the screen by this red hatch um, within that, located within the hydro corridor. Um, we've engaged a consultant um, who has um, provided an electromagnet electromagnetic field study that uh, has verified that at this distance, electromagnetic fields are found to be within, within, the, city's, um, within the city's guidelines. The towers and podiums have been located on the site in such a way that maximizes outdoor green space around the entire site with a focus on creating a central outdoor amenity space. Um, and this reference concept envisions that this, this central outdoor space um, be a place where residents and the community can meet and interact, uh, which will bring some much needed life and activation uh, to the public realm that surrounds this development. Thanks. Um, this slide shows the ground, the ground floor uses um, that, that are proposed across the development, starting again with Tower A um, to, to the west in yellow. You'll find a large community use space that the future development partner will be encouraged to, to provide. Um, the final program for this space is yet to be determined. Uh, the community use space has direct access to the Eglinton North Service Road to the south, a drop-off lay-by between the buildings on the site, and a direct connection to a dedicated outdoor green space that is proposed toward the, toward the rear of the site, protecting it from noise and uh, other activity along Eglinton. Staying within Tower A, the lobby will be accessed directly from the street, and the remainder of the ground floor will be used for back-of-house purposes. Uh, and, feature in, and will feature an enclosed loading area for move and move out for residents of this tower. Moving over to towers B and C, which are in, interconnected by a, a five-story podium, the ground floor of these towers will feature a centralized lobby that is accessed from a private driveway um, located in the center of the site. The central lobby will provide direct indoor access for residents to ground floor amenities, property management offices, backup house spaces, such as waste collection, bicycle storage, pet wash, et cetera. In support of the local cycling infrastructure, 
bicycle storage will form a significant portion of the ground, uh, ground floor and second floor um, and be a main feature of this future development. Many of the thousand plus bike parking spots um, that will be provided will be located um, at grade or on the second floor and conveniently located in secure rooms and would be complement and could be complemented by um, um, bike wash areas, bike maintenance facilities, etc. At a high level, our back one slide, sorry. At a high level, um, our team has been looking for ways to activate the edges of the site in Taure. This activation is, is intended to provide the um, is intended to be provided by the community use space. And our thoughts um, currently for the for Tower B and C is to achieve this objective by providing grade related townhomes along both the hydro corridor um, elevation as well as the Eglinton North Service Road. Residents of these units would have direct access to public realm and outdoor amenity areas and still have secure indoor access um, to the building's common areas, um, similar to all other residents um, in, found in, in these buildings. We have found this type of grade related townhomes uh, townhome unit to be quite successful um, in other uh, developments around the city. With respect to site circulation, um, aside from a small private driveway in the middle of the site, all other vehicular circulation is collected together um, to, in this gray area on the eastern edge of the site. This area provides access to the parking garage, um, an enclosed waste collection area, move in, move out for towers B and C, and the large um, bicycle parking facilities. This area also serves as a crash barrier between our, the, pro, pro, the proposed development and rail corridor to the east. Um, when developing properties that are adjacent to railway corridors, we typically look to um, a guideline called the Development in Proximity to Rail Operations Guide. This guide suggests um, that a 30 meter setback between rail corridors and new development is a, is, is, a, is a target requirement in most cases. However, the guide does detail an alternative um, arrangement that provides an opportunity to reduce that 30 meter setback to 20 meters. By locating back of house spaces um, in, in this area um, along the eastern edge of the property and constructing a two story uh, concrete crash wall along the edge of the building, we're able to safely take advantage of the setback reduction from the rail corridor which has allowed us to spread the buildings out on the site, um, which, and which also results in, in maximization of open space in the center of the site. Next. Um, here's a view looking uh, southeast from the, from the hydro corridor towards the, the Kennedy, uh, towards Kennedy Station. Um, again, we're proposing three towers with heights ranging from 22 stories to 40 stories. Um, you'll see, and you'll see a, a four to five story podium through, throughout. Um, you'll see that we've sketched in uh, some, some towers to the south of the site that illustrate potential future context um, that would may make sense for a transit oriented uh, development, uh, regardless of what eventually comes to pass. This highlights the large and interconnected green spaces at grade, um, supported by direct connections to indoor amenity space, as well as uh, the community, the community space, the community use space found in Tower A. And in addition to the outdoor amenity space found at grade, podium roofs feature programmed outdoor amenity space as well, which are intended to provide protected and secured amenities for residents to take that take full advantage of full sun and uh, unimpeded views of the surrounding areas. And finally, um, just a quick look. Um, Looking east along Eg Eglinton, um, this view highlights the significant uh, significant distance between the proposed development and the Eglinton overpass at the podium level. And we see that in order for this development to truly be successful from a city planning point of view, we, we need to come up with some creative solutions for improving the public realm directly in front of the site along the Eg Eglinton North Service Road that will enhance and activate um, this area and connect it back to this to surrounding communities. And so with that, I'll hand this over, hand it over to Scott Torrance from Forex, who will walk us through um, his thoughts on landscape and public realm for the site. Thank you. And, and Scott, just uh, before you come in, we're a couple minutes over the point where our presentation was intended to end. So I, I know there's only a handful of slides here, but just to, to keep them um, as succinct as you can so we can get to the discussion. And thanks to everybody for bearing with us. We're almost at the point where we can uh, have the questions and feedback. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good evening, everybody. As uh, David mentioned, my name is Scott Torrance. I'm the Senior Director of Landscape Architecture at Forec. Uh, as Jeffrey mentioned earlier in the presentation, there are a number of guidelines and standards that the design team has to follow in developing a reference concept design. Uh, many of these apply to the design of the public realm and outdoor spaces within the new community development. 
Uh, and to summarize these key points that we've looked at is to promote buildings that face parks and open spaces and have active uses on frontages. Uh, outdoor amenity spaces should offer an interface with the public realm, provide public access along, in, throughout, uh, and through natural open spaces. Playgrounds should be located away from streets. Improve the physical and visual access to natural features from public streets, parks, and open spaces. And the public realm will provide a comfortable, attractive, and vibrant, safe, and accessible setting for civic life and daily social and interaction. And I believe these uh, uh, points are all illustrated in the current arrangement of the uh, new community development. Although the uh, Although the new community is located uh, uh, near a, a major open space and recreational trail, the nearest public parks, Treverton and Jack Goodad, are a good 10 to 20 minute walk away. As such, we have consolida uh, consolidated and maximized the open space at ground level to support multiple activities. A central courtyard receiving eight hours of sunlight during the summer is at the heart of the new community. This is a place for the community to meet and engage with each other, providing flexible space for flea markets, movie nights, bread oven, appreciated outdoor work and study spaces. It's located far back from the service road, is a large uh, outdoor children and youth play area. Fitness equipment designed for all ages allows uh, the community to exercise outside, potentially before or after a walk or run on the well-used adjacent hydro recreational corridor, uh, multi-use trail. And space is provided for the community to grow their own food and flowers and gardens located in uh, the areas that receive the most sun throughout the day. And pe pets are provided uh, relief and exercise space conveniently located near building exits. Lastly, the buildings also provide outdoor uh, roof amenity areas, as David mentioned, providing residents with places to cook, dine, relax, socialize, and safe play spaces for toddlers away from the service road. A five meter or 16 and a half feet uh, property line setback for the new building uh, allows the creation of a generous planting zone for large native shade trees uh, along the south side of the building. A second row of trees may be planted in the public way to provide a more comfortable experience of shade and separation for pedestrians uh, using the sidewalk along this, the service road than they currently have now. I'd like to finish uh, the presentation with some other local projects my firm has designed that could be accommodated in the uh, new community. A community garden, as, as mentioned here, uh, examples of uh, outdoor all age fitness equipment, an example of children's learning and play area. Community meeting space with a shade structure, a running or walking track, uh, a multi use sports court. The rooftop amenity areas can accommodate dining, shaded spaces, group um, birthdays, uh, places to grow food, as well as places to work outdoor at these high tables show. And the roof garden uh, in the middle uh, bottom image, you know, shows even a spray pad uh, for use by children on hot summer days. The central space uh, at grade could accommodate outdoor movies, um, community markets. And lastly, on the bottom left, the image uh, of, of a project uh, near King and Parliament that shows how trees can really buffer um, and provide a comfortable space beside um, an overpass, in this case, the Richmond overpass. And lastly, an example of the architectural expression, the new buildings, bringing people um, and activating uh, the service road and allowing residents to utilize this incredible public transit opportunities right at their front door. And now I'll pass it over uh, to Jason to conclude uh, with the discussion of the project schedule. Thanks, Scott. So just to uh, wrap up the discussion, I will just give a, a, high, a brief and high level overview of the timeline and next steps. Um, so this site at 2444 Eglinton Avenue East was approved by Council in May of last year as a Housing Now site. Um, so in December of last year, we had retained our consultant team and uh, commenced with design development 
working uh, very closely with city staff on developing this concept that you're seeing today. So currently we are at the public consultation stage, having gone to the city's design review panel um, just last month in March for feedback on the reference concept. And so our next steps are now to finalize the reference concept, taking into consideration stakeholder feedback, um, such as the feedback that we will be getting tonight from the public, and then to take the site out to market for a partner in May of this year. Um, after that, we hope to have a partner selected and in place by the end of this year, um, following which the developer, the chosen developer partner will make a former, formal planning submission to the city for rezoning. And then shortly after the submission is made, um, further public consultation meetings will take place as part of the formal planning approvals process. And then after that, we would uh, estimate, just depending, I guess, on how that planning approvals process goes, that construction could take place as early as 2023 and with an estimated first occupancy around um, 2026. And with that, I think that concludes um, the presentation. Perfect, thanks. And I uh, will put the next slide up just to remind everybody one more time of the discussion questions, which are um, what, if anything, you like about the proposed design and the program objectives that you just saw, um, or if you have any suggested additions or changes to those design or program objectives, and if so, what are those? Um, and if you have any other comments or feedback for this team about the site uh, that may or may not fit into those first two questions. So that's it. Um, so we'll stop sharing the screen. And uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, say a few last uh, words about mechanics and then we will open the floor to, to, to you uh, and we want to spend the rest of the time hearing your feedback and questions. So, um, in case anybody had some trouble seeing the presentation or uh, early on, I know there are some technical glitches that might have happened and for everybody that's on the phone that might not have seen the presentation, I did want to let you know that the, the, the presentation will be shared on the on the CreateTO website at uh, createto.ca slash housing now. So if you did not see it or if a slide was, if for whatever reason, the technology wasn't working, um, you can still access that information um, that will be on, on the website. And also, if you don't get a chance to either ask your question or share your feedback in the next hour or so, um, you can still uh, contact us up to and including Thursday, April 30th. So this one hour is not the only time to weigh in on this. There is a couple of weeks um, uh, after today it, by which you can do that. And we'll share some more information about specifically how you can do that towards the end. But I did just want to let everybody know that before we get into the discussion, that if the technology doesn't didn't or doesn't hold up, or if you just need a bit more time to have a think before you share feedback, you do have more time than just this, this hour. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give everybody that has logged in via um, the either a phone or a tablet or a desktop the ability to be a panelist. So you're going to, if you're uh, depending on the device that you're using, it might look a little bit different, but basically in a few seconds, you will have the ability to turn your camera and your microphone on if you would like. We are not going to manage anybody's camera or mic. We're certain we're definitely going to not going to turn your camera on. Um, if you would like to turn it on, it's great. It's always nice to see a face uh, or more faces makes these meetings feel more human. Uh, but of course, um, you do not have to turn your camera on if there is no reason. And um, uh, we will only manage a microphone if there's an ambulance in the background or a dog barking or something that makes it impossible to have the discussion. But we'd also um, um, ask everybody to just manage their own mics as, as we go. For the folks that are on the phone, um, if you want to raise your hand to ask a question or share feedback, and I see there's quite a few that have joined us by the phone this evening, so this is um, important. You just press star three on your phone, and that will put you uh, in the queue to have a, to to come up. So, um, and for those that are uh, that are going to be on camera, you can always wave at us just uh, with, with your hand, the old-fashioned way, or you can press the raise hand button, which will look a little different, of course, depending on which device you're on, but it will either look like a little hand or just the text that says raise hand. So with that uh, technological preamble, I'm pressing the button now. So you should all begin um, to join as panelists. And I already see a hand up, which is perfect. Um, so I'm gonna start there just as a way uh, to begin and then um, uh, we'll, we'll go through others as they go. So the hand is up from someone, I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, it's uh, Bethany. 
Um, so if you want to unmute yourself, Sunny, and ask your question or share your feedback, we'll we'll get uh, we'll do our best to get you a question or an answer. May I, I'll, I'll unmute you just for now, and then I see another hand has gone up. So, Darvathan, you're unmuted. Do you want to try your question or your feedback? Oh, hand has gone down, and they have left. So, uh, I guess the. Um, um, so I'm going to go uh, to the next. So this is a person on the phone. Don't see a name, um, but you, you should be unmuted now. Hello. Hello. I'm Siromi from uh, 2460 Eglinton Avenue East. Okay. I have two questions. Okay. The first one is uh, regarding the, the tall buildings guidelines for Eglinton Avenue East. We request that you follow that and not uh, so that there will be uh, no redu there will be that will provide reduction in density and sunlight and air circulation to the existing buildings. Okay, um, you said you had two. That's not really. That's more a comment than a question. But you said you had a second one too. Just wanted yeah. to. Okay, the second just... one is also a com comment. Request that the city follow the proximity guidelines and best practices guide and keep minim minimum 30 meters setback from usable space to the tracks along with the crash wall in order to minimize rail disasters as sea and freight trains run on these tracks at night as well as the go trains during the day. Rather than go for the 20 meters, we, we suggest that you take the 30 meters setback. Okay, um, maybe I'll, I'll um, go to city planning and see if they want to respond. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, in terms of how you are following, if you're following the tall buildings guidelines and the proximity guidelines. So, Annalie, Jeffrey, uh, over to you. Um, sure. I'll, I'll start with the rail safety guidelines and then pass it over to Jeffrey for tall buildings. So, thank you for the question. I'm, uh, I think it's a really good point. This site has, uh, obviously a very prominent side, which is the rail tracks. So the city's rail safety guidelines uh, recommend 30, require 30 meter separation. However, if the building can incorporate a crash wall, and that is indeed what David mentioned when he was talking about the design of the building, you are able to locate the building within 20 meters of the rail. So the crash wall does serve as a what's called a vertical separation to provide that safety in the event of any rail disaster. And these are guidelines that we follow across the entire city for the CP, CN, uh, GO, Metrolinx lines that crisscross all of Toronto. So I do just want to emphasize that safety um, is a critical consideration when we're looking at this reference concept. I'll pass it over to Jeffrey on the. Uh, no, on the... Uh, I have another question. That 30 so, meter so guideline. I just want to make sure we we have a, a lot of hands up. So I'm just, if it's okay, I'd like to get the Jeffrey to answer the second part of your question. We can come back okay. to you, Siromi. Um, if, okay, if sure. that's to, But there's about 10 other people. I just want to make sure we get okay. to as many as we can. But Jeffrey, I you can't you can answer that second question now, and then we'll go to some other folks. Um, so thank you very much for your comment. Um, what what I would say uh, related to the tall buildings guidelines is that any proposal for you know multiple towers on a site um, would be evaluated um, under the tall buildings guidelines. I think I uh, made mention of a few of the things that we look at uh, kind of in terms of general um, <clears throat> umbrellas. Uh, we look at the site context. Uh, to remind everyone the site organization, how uh, development is organized on the site, open spaces, um, building separation, uh, where where we're locating uh, podiums, step backs, etc. Uh, the tall building design, um, and then we look at the pedestrian realm. <clears throat> now, with respect to fit and transition, um, we look for tall buildings to respect and to respect at least and integrate uh, with the height, scale, and character of uh, some of the neighboring buildings. Um, however, right in the guidelines, embedded in the guidelines, is uh, that we are to reinforce um, the broader city structure 
uh, which I spoke to in my um, my earlier comments, um, where to provide a horizontal separation. Um, I did do a little bit of a measurement uh, prior to this meeting, and I think that the condos uh, just immediately to the east um, are about 42 meters, 40 thereabouts meters away from the uh, where the future property line will be. Uh, so that would be in excess of the 25 meter separation distance that we would typically ask for. Um, and that's to the property line. There's going to be further setbacks to the podium and then further step backs to the tower. Um, but uh, we look we look for transition to lower scale buildings and to maintain sunlight and sky view um, for neighboring properties. So that's just going to be those are going to be a few of our uh, considerations uh, when we when we um, evaluate a, a formal application. Great, thanks. I, and I'm just okay. I'm going to go to the next person, um, but certainly we can uh, come back to you if you if you press star three again, just to put your hand down. That will um, let me know to come back to you if you put it back up. And that, that's not just for Stormy, that's for everybody as we as we go through. Uh, so I've got Riti as the next person. So Riti, if you want to unmute yourself um, and uh, share your feedback or question. So is this a done deal then? My question to the team. Uh, in in term, uh, could you elaborate? You mean is it done deal that there's going to be a I mean, can, can we not oppose this this project? I understand. So because guess, there is the parking that's gone, right. and this is going to be a hub, and we want people to use transit. So where are they going to park the cars? Right. Good. Um, so I think there's a two parter there. One is is. Uh, what's the best way to oppose it? Uh, and one, I think one is to is to share that opposition here and both your uh, two councillors are here and listening. So I think that it's important um, uh, as well as the city and create to you. Uh, I think your other question about parking, uh, which is where are the, is the parking gonna go? I think is uh, maybe best uh, a combination of create to you and city planning, but uh, please jump in um, uh, project team where you think is best to talk about the, the next, um, how you're thinking about parking and where the people that currently parked are gonna go. Okay, I'll, I'll start with that, Ian, and, and thank you for that question. Um, we know that parking is a part of how people get to transit, so that's absolutely something we're aware of. But I do want to emphasize that City Council adopted and accepted that this would be one of the sites for the Housing Now program. And, um, you know, that is something that was approved at City Council in May of 2020. So what we're here today to try to do is to try to provide a proposal that you know, meets the urgent need for affordable housing in the city um, and for to bring people right directly to transit. So I'm just I'm acknowledging the fact that that this is a parking lot that you know is used not maybe not as much as other parking facilities in the area, but that um, that the replacement use on the site is going to be for a, a much needed city use as well. On our other sites, we have made available the opportunity for shared parking. So um, where parking isn't used during the day by residents of the building or by visitors of the building, permitting the uh, operator of the building to open up access to the unused spots during the day to people who may wish to use a lot for a commuter function. So it's something that we've heard on other sites. Councillor Crawford will be well aware of that from his sites and his ward. Um, so I do want to share with you that it's something we've heard and we've thought about uh, across the city when we've done housing now. Okay, thanks, Annalie. And I, I see a lot of hands up, so I'm just going to try to get to as many as possible. Other project team members, please jump in as you need, but I'm going to try to just keep going just in the interest of, of getting to as many of these questions or comments as possible. So I see uh, Shoba next. So Shoba, we'll go to you for your, your question or comment. Hi, I was just wondering about the noise impact. Uh, so with the construction and with all these people, the residents in these new buildings, how are we going to be affected? I live at 2460 Lington Avenue and I work from home. And as it is, I'm having a difficult time with the TTC work that's going on beside my building. Uh, I can't even attend the calls. Most of the time I have to go on mute. Uh, right. so I'm just thinking about what will happen in the next few years. Right, so I think, um, Jason, you could maybe start talking about uh, how uh, the agreement with the developer works for construction and then um, city planning, if there's any standards uh, for construction management plans that uh, to supplement, I think that would be good. 
Sure. So I guess the main thing um, would be that it is the uh, noise bylaw, which the developer proponent, once they're on board and starting construction, would have to comply by. Um, another, I guess, big part of what we do in choosing a developer partner is, you know, we're, we're always looking for a developer proponent that has a solid reputation and track record and, you know, they respect the community and when there are concerns or issues about you know, let it be noise, dust, construction activity, um, you know, that uh, being a partner with the city of Toronto um, and, you know, a being a reputable developer partner, they would be taking those concerns into um, uh, definite consideration uh, during construction of the project. Um, the other thing, just to your other comment about um, noise just in general for residents. So as part of the uh, proposal, when the developer proponent makes a formal submission to the city, they will also have to do uh, a noise or acoustic report. And if there are any recommendations that are required from the acoustic consultants to be implemented, um, those would have to be implemented as part of the process. Um, I guess I'll throw it over to Jeffrey to speak about, I guess also the, one of the real main important triggers of controlling noise would be the construction management plan. So thank you, Jason. Um, I think I think you captured it. As a part of the city's process, uh, we would require a future uh, developer partner to provide a construction management plan. Uh, that, construction, that construction management plan would have to look at dust and mud control, uh, the location of truck loading points, um, parking for construction trades, even how to deal with vermin and rodents and other um, matters related to temporary storage of materials. Um, and on the noise, uh, further on the noise front, um, as a part of an application like this, we would require a noise impact study to be done by a qualified um, consultant. Uh, we would evaluate that noise study um, to uh, ensure that um, noise levels on the um, on the proposal are, are are appropriate or are within um, uh, got, said, um, not only city guidelines but uh, provincial guidelines, um, and uh, that any mitigation um, measures uh, that needed to be needed to take place um, on the building um, or um, uh, at the edge of the uh, proposal uh, were implemented. So uh, that, that would be it on the, um, on the noise front. Sorry, one other quick thing if I could add um, is also as part of the process when the developer proponents will start construction, you know, they will have signs uh, on the property for contacts, uh, you know, so if residents do have some concerns about noise or even dust or mud, as, as Jeffrey mentioned, there will be notices posted on site for site contacts where community members and residents can call in and uh, voice any concerns that they would have regarding any concerns that they, they would have, noise, dust, whatever that may be. Okay, good. So Shrub, I hope that gets, uh, gets you the answer. And, yep. Thank you. Yep, good, perfect. Thanks, thank you. And also thanks for turning on your camera. It's nice to, always nice to see a, a face. So I'm gonna go, um, next to someone on the phone. I'm just gonna periodically check in on the folks on the phone. And as a reminder, if you are on the phone and want to raise your hand, star three is the way to do that. Um, so just I'll, I'll try to remind everybody of that as well. So I'm gonna unmute uh, someone on the phone now. You're gonna hear a little message and then you can answer your, um, or ask your question. Hi, uh, this is Regini David. I uh, live in Scarborough Centre and work around Kennedy and Eglinton, just across the uh, site that you guys are talking about. And we, I do service uh, quite a lot of uh, people in that neighbourhood. And affordable housing is a huge issue uh, in Scarborough and across the city. And I'm really um, good to see. And I would like to thank everyone who is working on this project, including you know uh, even city staff and councillor and everybody, uh, taking the affordable housing issue seriously. And uh, I'm also really pleased to see that the plan is actually really, um, you know, including uh, the 20% uh, uh, of the unit is accessible and also um, looking through, you know, the mixed income 
um, community near transit, and um, and also especially that uh, one third of uh, the unit is going to be affordable uh, rental. So my question is, um, these are really um, great uh, start because we do need and we know that how the affordable uh, housing crisis is affecting our community. But how 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 much uh, you know? This is really going to help the low-income people. How is that? What is the affordable, uh, you, you know, those uh, unit? How do you actually defend based on people's income uh, or based on um, market rent? Because the people that who are really being affected, if it is not based on income, and it's going to leave out many people. And also, Scarborough has affected uh, yeah, big time, and it's uh, it's good to see there's three sites now. But we need more of these projects in Scarborough. And what is it uh, plan? You know, I know that there's uh, city councillors are there too. And and we really, um, you know, again, I really thank everyone who is working on. But we need this more more of these uh, projects. And if there's, you know, plan to bring more in Scarborough. And also, I would really like to hear more about that affordable, uh, how we uh, determine uh, who will be, you know, uh, eligible for those affordable units. Okay, um, so thank you for that. So I think maybe Valesa is probably the best person from the housing secretary to answer your question about um, uh, the degree of support for low income people. Um, so Valesa, over to you to, to talk a little bit about that in housing now and, and also the housing spectrum more broadly. Thanks Ian and uh, thank you so much for the question. Yes, we do acknowledge the need for, um, for affordable housing across our city. Um, in terms of qualifications for affordable housing, so essentially some, to qualify for affordable housing, which the city defines as 100% average market rent or below. So for instance, for 2021, for a one bedroom unit, that works out to be $1,431 per month for a one bedroom unit. So in order to qualify for that unit, um, a person's income cannot be more than four times the, the rent. And that's that's annually. Um, the prior to the, the completion of construction, um, the city works with the selected non sorry the selected developer, and we um, collaborative collaboratively develop a tenant access plan. So that tenant access plan outlines things like um, what types of, of of priority groups, for instance, if if we're targeting. Um, women for the site or seniors or a subsection that that tenant access plan will, have, will lay out um, those requirements. It will also lay out how units will be advertised to the public um, and many other um, many other factors. In terms of people who require deeper levels of affordability, um, it's typically how it works is the rents are set um, at housing now sites at a project average of 80% average market rents. So across all units, it'll be 80% of 1431, for instance. And how it works is if someone is in receipt of a housing benefit, um, for instance, Ontario Works or ODSP or a city housing allowance, that can be layered on to that rent to deepen affordability. So that's just one way that we, in the absence of, of providing subsidized housing, that's one way we use affordable housing to deepen affordability. So I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks, Valesa. And um, I'm just going to, uh, Valesa, if the next question comes through, your, your audio is a little quiet, at least on my end. I'm not sure if others had a tough time, so it might just be good to be a bit closer to your microphone, but I think it was audible, but just for, for future ones. Um, but uh, so thanks for that. So I'm going to go next. Uh, I'm going to go off back to someone um, who's on the software. So I see uh, Anthony. Um, Anthony, we'll go to you next. Hey, uh, thanks so much. Uh, and I want to thank city staff um, for all their work on this. Um, I really support the project. I was wondering what is the um, the highest density that's been achieved on the Golden Mile by a, uh, a private sector development? Do we have that number? Um, and I guess the second part of that question is, uh, is this project um, meeting or exceeding that? Okay. Um, uh, it might be Jeffrey. Um, 
area planner. Jeffrey, to speak to the, if you know, off the top of your head, the highest height on the Golden Mile and how this compares to that. And if I you don't, don't I, I, I don't have that um, that figure right kind of at my fingertips. Um, but May I offer some uh, comments on that? Sure, sure. Um, it's uh, it's um, <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. It's it's fluid at this point, but it is consistent with respect to the highest density that is being proposed on this particular site. I think that you'll see some of the um, the sites on the Golden Mile approaching forty stories. Thank you, uh, Councillor Thompson. So, Anthony, that um, I guess that answers the question. Uh, it's uh, if it looks like there are around forty stories, and and so this is a little bit less than that at the moment. But as Councillor Thompson said, it is fluid. So, yeah, thank you for that. I I, I would I would support the city project um, being as high or higher than the um, uh, the, the highest density achieved by private sector development to to deliver more affordable housing. Yeah, but Anthony, are you living it close by here? We we, Sorry, uh, Cody, we we just we have to do kind of one at a time. Otherwise, it, I, I will come to you for sure. I know. The concern is the support that, that I heard two speakers talking about support for the project, but they don't live in this particular area, so they will not be affected. Well, so it's, it's to say that you're going to be you're, you're supporting it, but what effect does it have on their property value? Because I live here at 2460. Mm -hmm. This is going to have a severe impact on our property value. Right. Okay. And at no time have you guys ever consulted with us about setting up this project here. You just did it like that and drop it on our heads like that. Right. right. So, as far as I'm concerned, as president of the condo board here, I can tell you categorically clear every resident in this complex, over a thousand, object to this development. We do not want it next to us. Period. Okay. So, um, thank you uh, for that. Some strong concern, and uh, obviously, you're not happy about it at all, and some concerns about not being consulted about it in the first place. I think Annalie is probably the best person to start to respond to that point, Khalid. And I do, I do have a list of others. So, I, but I appreciate that this is very important. So, I do want to make sure that there's space for Annalie to respond to this. This point. is not in our interest for those of us who live here at Rainbow. Okay. It is not. I would Annalie. like to, to concur with that. Um, yeah. I am sorry, a resident here as well. And I, I don't think they're taking into consideration how much we've already suffered with, with all of this construction happening. Right. Also, right. you are going to be taking away our sunshine with the 40 story building. Right. Uh, I, I totally appreciate that. Yes, you know, affordable housing needs it. Um, I understand that at Golden Mile, it's uh, 40 stories high, but you're not blocking other residents from there. There's no other uh, buildings that are blocking or residential areas uh, in that area. Whereas mm -hmm. in this particular area, it's right opposite facing the building 2460. You are taking away everybody's um, brightness, sunshine, uh, not to mention the construction that's going to be going on, uh, not to mention um, all of the, the rodents and stuff that will be coming out there. I think we've gone through enough already and um, we, we need this sunshine, we need this space. Um, you know, uh, we, we definitely should be consulted uh, and um, I'm all in for it. Yes, that, uh, you know, it, it, it should not be in this particular area. Golden okay. Mile is fine. Victoria is fine. There's, they're not blocking anybody else, but this particular area, I'm sorry to say, um, and yes, we would like to find a way how we can uh, voice our opinion more uh, rather than this, this two minutes talk, because I don't really want to waste everybody's time as well. Well, it's not, it's not a waste of anyone's time. This is exactly the point of the meeting. So I just want to say that, but I did want to turn over to Annalie. Uh, and we, sure. So Annalie, please. Um, and I, I didn't get your your name, but I just want to say, you know, it takes a lot to stand up and, and share these kinds of opinions in, in a public meeting. So thank you for that. My comment would be that the city is doing this together with Create TO, and what we're trying to do with a reference concept is to come up with a way of guiding the future developer to provide something that we think um, is a high quality design that that doesn't take away from the community, but rather contributes to it. So setting aside the need for affordable housing, I mean, our landscape architects shared some fantastic options for how the public realm will be improved. 
I know you're concerned about uh, sunlight facing the west side of the tower. But one of the things that uh, my colleague Jeffrey spoke to was the tall building guidelines. And that means that buildings are maximum 750 square square meter floor plate, which is uh, a smaller floor plate than the 2460 floor plate, for example. So I know you're accustomed to kind of a long rectangular building, but that's not what's being proposed here. Buildings like that provide more access to sun and uh, and faster moving shadows as the day goes on. So there are design guidelines that the city uses for tall buildings, and we are aware of the impact that tall buildings have on adjacent properties, but we also know that there's ways of dealing with that while meeting the urgent need for housing and providing high quality design. So we absolutely hear you, but we're looking at ways to accommodate the number of units we need within uh, a design program that doesn't affect you in the way that I think you are maybe concerned that it will. So, no. yeah, I, I just, I, I've got about 15 other people at least queued up. I, I do want to try to get to as many as possible. I know that was an important one to jump in from the residents from, from 2460. So I think it was important, but I, if I, I'd like to go to the others and we can come back um, if, if, if it has there's time, but. Um, uh, I, so it's, I'm Ron, gonna... it's Ron Parkinson at Treverton. And I just want to just say the same thing that, you know, this has been announced by Mayor Tory a year ago in May. We didn't hear anything about it. Now it's a year later and I appreciate all the work you've done, but not anyone in this area has been consulted. Now you're right. getting this big backlash. So understand yeah. why if you live on this side of the street, so to speak, the, the bus has left the station and we're now trying to recoup from all this. So I really, really, you know, take this, per don't take this personal. This is the politics that's involved in this and you're not consulting with us. And we really need to know that. I'm not here to say it's not in my neighborhood. I need to know why we are tearing up the parking lot that you just spent millions of dollars on. Right. Why did you do that? This is a hub where people are going to come off the GO station or want to go up the GO station. They need parking. It's, if Very you good. ever walk over there, you'll know it's packed. It's packed with parking. And now you're taking it away. And it, where's the schools for all these 900 units? That's going to be 2,000 people. Please, you haven't shown us anything except shown us some pictures, which is architecture. And you've right. got this, the bus was left the station by us looking at it this right now and saying, you know, we've got uh, developers ready to start right now and dig into the ground. That's not fair. And that won't be acceptable for anyone. It's our neighborhood as well. And we want people here, but we want it in the right way. How many right. affordable housing is in Scarborough versus North York versus downtown Toronto? And my exactly. one last point, my one last point is with Toronto Community Housing, they integrated through the developers in Regent Park. Why are we not trying to do that with every developer in the city now who are building uh, condos 40 stories high at Young and Eglinton, squeezing people in there? Why are they not being accommodated and saying, you have to have 10% of this or this or this and put it in the building code? Now you have people living and in integrated nicely instead of hoarding them. That's the thing that we want to do. So we all want to live in harmony, but we need everyone to do something about this and we need you but we need our politicians to step up to that too. We all agree on it. How do we do it? But we haven't been included in it. That's my point. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ron. Okay. Um, there was a lot there, Ron. I was, we were taking lots of detailed notes to make sure that we got all your concerns there. I think concerns about process, concerns of, about engagement, about where the school is going to go, the investment in the parking lot, um, and wanting to see more integration rather than kind of consolidating things. Um, uh, to name a few, I'm just scanning my notes quickly. So we've got, um, this is exactly why we came to hear the, the concerns, the things that, um, if there are things that people like, which we've heard some of, and things that people are concerned about, which we've heard a lot of recently. So it's, um, so I just want to say thank you for that. And I, I don't, I, I think it makes sense to go to the next person on the list at the moment. Well, just sorry, one, one last thing. So with all yeah. that said and done, one consultation is not going to do anything. This is just sort of putting the, the fire on. Right? right, you really do need to have continuous forums going on, and you're going to have to speed it up now if you yep. want to do this thing. But I'm still saying, as far as the city of Toronto goes, where is the population density going for this stuff? Okay, we yep. don't want a, a Regent Park, right? We got to split up. And I'm not saying that the people that are making fifty thousand is in Regent Park. You're jamming too many people together, and it's not going to be a good social thing there. And you look at Trinity Park as an example. Thank you. Ian, can I just point yes, out, please. just in case it wasn't clear from the presentation, which I know will be online, is that um, we're not, we're actually in front of you today because we haven't even got to the point of selecting a developer. So what we wanted to do was hear from the community 
um, so that when we put it out to the market to select a developer, they are aware of what uh, the community is saying. So, you know, I think that that's actually the, the goal, and I understand uh, where the challenge lies for you, was to actually reach out to the community well before. So we can say when we go out to the development community, this is what we heard from the public. So when you're putting together your proposal, these are things you should consider. And Ian's team is putting together a report and there'll be a recording of this meeting. And these are things that will be available to the development community when they're bidding on it. So really the point is to have you provide input before a developer even comes in with a concept. So um, again, if that wasn't clear, we can make sure that we are much clearer about that when we present uh, at subsequent meetings. And and Thanks. also, I believe also that there is future engagement planned as part of that as well. If I'm not not mistaken, Jason, maybe Correct. you could and or or Salima speak to the future engagement so that because Ron, you did say one meeting is not enough, and I don't think that that's the Create or City's intention to have just one meeting either. But um, maybe someone well, not enough. Let me let me clarify. One meeting is not enough. It's the timing of the meeting. So if you go another right. six months and drop another bomb on us, this is what's going to happen again. And I appreciate Ann Alley, uh, that was what you're speaking about. This is the big picture. 17, you're putting on a map right now. But if you look at the density of all around historically, what is that doing to our neighborhoods? Whether it's Parkdale, Jane Finch, Scarborough, it's very you know marginalized. And we see that with COVID right now. So we need to look at that and make sure that we have enough space for everyone. And we're, there's a lot of land out there. There's a lot of land and developers are building. And if they want to do business and make their money, you put some accommodation in for everybody then. And that'd okay. be the, that'd be the solution. You won't have to worry about a parking spot. Okay, so I've, I do wanna to go to some other folks. We've had quite a bit, um, but- I here. appreciate your time. Yep. No, thank you for your time. I'm going to, so I'm going to go somewhere on the phone again, just to go uh, back there. So you're going to hear a message and then you can answer your, uh, ask your question or share your feedback. So the person on the phone, you're unmuted. Hello. Hello. Yep. Hi. Hi. I'll just make this quick. So I won't take very much time. I just want to say as a 30 year resident of Scarborough, 2293 Eglinton Avenue East, uh, I just want to uh, commend the city of Toronto for this uh, affordable housing project. And I just want to say I fully support it. And that's basically my my piece. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, I'll do one more on the phone while we're here, just because it's um, uh, a bit easier. So uh, next person on the phone. Um, yes, my name is Odessa, and I am living at 2460 Eglinton. And I'm right behind where you guys are talking. And I'm telling you, I'm going through hell with the TTC from 4.30 in the morning. I can't sleep, I can't pray, I can't do nothing. I am going through a devil of a time with them. Okay. And to bring that here and to take away my little sunshine, I can't go outside. So what happens if we have an outbreak again? How are we going to be managing? Mad or something? Why can they not go up north? There's a lot of land space up north. Okay, so they, I think that's. Yep. We're asking so, the people just to. We are paying taxes, you know. Yeah, so I think, guys, if I understood you well, just as some of the similar concerns we heard earlier about construction, the noise. Um, yes. Yeah. Noise yes. And, and. Yeah. Yeah. So with all that building is coming here, that noise is going to be worse. Yeah. So and you said TTC is that from transit running or construction of the the new line? From the construction and from the um, the, um, the 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 Amtrak right. that comes down and it makes all that noise with the engine. Yep. And um, the TTC with the plowing. And the drilling in the morning from 4.30 in the morning. Exactly, yes. 4.30, yeah. so I live right behind there, right there. And I can't oh. sleep, my bedroom is there. I have no, no, it's sometimes I'm like I'm going to go mad. Okay, so I think, uh, Odessa, there's uh, lots of, lots there. We do have some folks from Metrolinx that are on the call and maybe they can speak a little bit to how they're managing the construction and, and noise associated with the crosstown because that sounds like the, the most acute thing that you're mentioning here. 
Yes, so, and also I am not a. I am not saying that um, un, the housing is not um, uh, important, but I also saying that think about the people that buy. Yeah. They buy. Some people sell their house and come here and to buy to be comfortable. And for God's sake, you bring in another. I say on the on the form on the paper. I see that they send. There is a, um, a tall building is going to be there, block my window, right there, right there. Right. Okay, so I, I think I'm going to go uh, just to Wilfred uh, or uh, Yesser from, from Metrolinx to speak to the Crosstown construction and how, you're, how Metrolinx is managing noise impacts or, or trying to anyway during uh, the construction. Uh, hello, uh, so I'm Wilfred. I'm a community specialist with the Metrolinx Crosstown project. Uh, so I do hear a lot of your concerns and I've dealt with a few of these concerns uh, with my time with Crosstown. Uh, and I assure you that the Crosstown is doing everything that we can to mitigate the disruption and the noise as much as possible. Uh, we do have monthly meetings where I know some of you guys are members of those meetings and you've heard uh, a lot of the, the mitigations that we use. Um, if you have not reached out to us previously, I invite you to do so now uh, where we can try and work on trying to mitigate more of those disruptions that we're causing. Uh, so my phone number is 416-482-7411. So if you are dealing with any uh, frustrations in dealing with the crosstown, whether that be noise impacts or vibration impacts, please do give me a call. Uh, and I'd be happy to to look at what we can do to try and mitigate any of the disruption that we are causing. And we'll, we'll also just for if anyone didn't have a chance to write that down, we'll make sure we put that phone number in the meeting notes as well, just so in case it, it went by too fast for you. So we'll make sure that you have the, a way to contact um, Wilfred that way too. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Wilfred. And I, I'm going to just go, uh, uh, Dessa, I'm going to go to the next person um, that's got a hand up here, which uh, looks like it is uh, just tracking Ethel. So, Ethel, if you uh, want to unmute yourself um, and share your feedback or ask your question. So, I want to know how um, the heights were determined and why it is. Uh, so, how the heights were determined. And is the placement of the two buildings, so th that would be the one that's 30 story and 40 story. Mm -hmm. If you flip over to the east facing view, there's a shot I took with my camera. It shows directly the sunlight that falls on 2460. I live in 2460 facing west. This means from a roughly one o'clock in the afternoon, we will have shade right through the evening. We don't get the morning sun naturally because we face the west. So how did uh, the, the number that the heights of the two buildings come up, 40 story and a 30 story? And mm -hmm. is there any chance that, that those, those heights can be lowered? They stand out, they're quite incongruous in this neighborhood, quite okay. incongruous. I'm at mid-level, ninth floor. I see nothing higher than 2460. So I'd like to know how those heights came up and whether there'd be an opportunity to work with the developer to lower those heights, because I am in favor of the project. Okay, thanks Ethel, for that. Uh, Jason, do you want to explain the height rationale? Why, how, how, or how the heights were determined? Um, and if anyone else wants to jump in after Jason, we can go there. Sure, maybe I'll throw it over to David to get into the technical aspects of how those heights were determined, but once again, um, Ethel, this is a reference concept design, and as you know, as we mentioned, this is kind of create TOs um, and the city's uh, version of what they'd like to see at this site. But as you mentioned, there will definitely be an opportunity to work with the developer partner once they are retained um, on the, the further development and refinement of the site. So um, there definitely is that opportunity. This isn't. You know, what we presented today isn't the end all and be all. Um, this is just our reference concept design. And then, you know, the design will be fine tuned further with the developer partner and also with further community consultation. So maybe I'll just throw it to David for the more technical um, aspect of how the heights were determined. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Um, 
at a high level, our, our, we had a few objectives here that we were um, trying to meet. And one was just to, to, to maximize housing on this site uh, because it is a transit oriented uh, development. Um, so, you know, it, it's in, do, in doing so, we kind of cons considered it from a few uh, 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 different a a avenues, but really um, we, we looked to some of the work that had been done um, to date um, around this site, and that was starting with the um, Kennedy um, Mobility Hub Study, um, which had already um, envisioned um, towers of, of this height uh, in the area, um, in the areas around uh, the Kennedy Station. So we kind of um, were just looking at, at work that had been done already um, and, and, and looking to support it and build on it. Um, and that's how we've arrived at, at our maximum heights. And then when we looked at, at the variety of heights um, from 20 to 30 to 40 stories, we, we, we did want to, to make sure that we weren't um, providing, let's say three towers of identical heights. We wanted some variety um, um, and, and to uh, make sure that we considered the, the, the skyline um, and how, how, how this development was viewed from from the surrounding area. So, those were kind of some some high high level points um, that we considered when when um, to determining heights. Okay, I appreciate that. But you, you, that being said, right beside it, where there is a strip plaza with a bank and a drugstore and a grocery store, that's going to go. That's going to have to go in time. Put your towers over there, far enough away from anyone else. Is the other project across the street at Kennedy South? West corner, that's going to get developed. So there's lots of place to put these towers where they're not going to impede our vision or impair anything around the mobility hub. I'd like to okay. see that project just have mid-rise uh, mid -rise apartments. So I, feel, I, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for that and thank you for the support. Um, this is a piece of this is a piece of land owned by the city. The city doesn't own land uh, at the plaza or further east or west. Um, and I just wanted to say that we know with transit comes increased pressure for development and increased pressure for tall buildings. Our opportunity here is to set a precedent for um, what the height datum should be and the quality of design and the types of housing that can be provided along the transit line. So, um, you know, we don't own that plaza. Uh, so, that's not really up to us, but it's really, I think, in the city's best interest to have a high quality building set the tone for what's going to happen along the corridor here. And that's what our opportunity is here. And that's what we will, that's the expectation we're going to set for the future developer partner here. Then when the next developer comes, they'll know what the city's expectation is and hopefully that sets a, a better precedent than kind of a, a wild east, so to speak, um, which is what I think you're also, or you're, you're, you and your colleague or uh, neighbors may be concerned about. It's a good project. I will say that. I like it. I'd just like to see the heights of the building reduced. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Ethel. Um, and it's good to hear both um, Things that you like as well as things that you don't like, and especially I feel like you suggest you set a specific suggestion on something to change about it, reducing the heights. I think is always exactly the type of feedback we're looking to hear is uh, where where you have constructive advice on how it could be better. That's what we'd love to hear. So thank you for that, Ethel. Um, I'm Can I just speak to a couple of the policy documents that we would want to also take into consideration when when looking at this in partnership with CreateTO? Um, I'll just just really quickly. I just wanted to um, indicate that as planners, we're obligated to look at the um, growth plan 2019, um, as well as uh, the official plan. And I think I had mentioned earlier that <clears throat> we don't have the opportunity to place um, intensity um, everywhere in the city. We focus that intensity. <clears throat> um, or intensification rather um, to centers, uh, the downtown and along avenues. This is an avenues overlay um, and it's a mixed use area. So this would be one of the areas where we think that um, intensification should be accommodated. Uh, this is where we would direct it, if anywhere, is along this stretch. Um, and then the second thing uh, related to the growth plan 
um, is that the city is is uh, uh, as planners we're responsible to look at um, because of the physical proximity of the site to the uh, Kennedy Station and all the other transit uh, related um, lines that are in the area. Uh, we're required to look at transit oriented development. Um, and essentially that is a mix of uses and incomes um, at um, organized within walking distance of a rapid transit station and at densities which support transit ridership um, so that people can walk to transit services quickly and conveniently, et cetera. So my point there is, is that um, the, the portion of that that speaks to densities that support transit ridership so we would want um, from a from the city's perspective the most intense development or the most um, the development that ha that houses the most intensification closest to the um, closest to the station and this is essentially right across the street walking distance so those are some of the considerations that go into what we what we look at, at, at as a city um, in working with createo and developing um, something like what you're seeing today Okay. I just want to see that well, some details. I'm sorry. I'm going to go next to um, uh, maybe Mark because uh, we've had your hand up for a bit there. Housing now, Mark. Um, so uh, you can unmute yourself, and if you've got a question or feedback, please please go. Uh, yeah, I'm partly start with a comment. Um, I understand there are folks who live nearby who are concerned about the height and density of the building, and about people who don't live next door to the building uh, commenting on what should be built there. Um, people all across the city of Toronto have just paid six and a half billion dollars to build the LRT. We're just about to spend another six billion dollars extending the Scarborough subway. It intersects in your neighborhood. It intersects yeah, yeah. on your doorstep. So there's going to be density at that location. In particular to, to staff, uh, I'm assuming this is going to be a protected major transit service area from the province. And I don't know what the current count of uh, housing and jobs is in this area, um, but it'd be interesting to know that to see how close you are to what the anticipated target is for a protected major transit service area. Also to the architect, I don't think we saw we saw heights on the buildings. We saw some square footage on the community space. We never saw square footage converted into unit counts if you were looking at the um, drawing up guidelines and the tower guidelines and the accessibility guidelines, you must have some rough numbers on how many units you're generating. Uh, you know, a ballpark between this and this would be would be useful. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. So there's a couple of feed, uh, advice in there, which we'll take. Um, the question at the end there is if you have a rough ballpark of the unit count uh, order of magnitude. So maybe Jason, CreateTO, have you thought about that yet or, or, or David as well? Sure, yeah, David uh, did kind of mention that it might have uh, passed by quick, but we are pushing just over 900 uh, units here. So, you know, as mentioned, we are trying to maximize the amount of affordable rentals. So being a third of that, so we are pushing uh, close to at least 300 affordable rental units and a total of just over 900. Good, thanks. Um, good, uh, so thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next, uh, if you're okay with uh, that, I'm gonna just go to the next person on the phone here. So you should hear um, the, like a little beep and then you can ask your question or share your feedback. I've unmuted you, do you wanna, hello? Hello. Yep. Uh, Hi. Uh, I'm Hector. I'm living in an apartment, and every year they increase my rental. When I heard about this project, which helps people who have their own home, I agree with the project. When it comes to the noise, anything that they have a problem, it might be for five to ten years, maybe the construction. After that, it would be very peaceful. Regarding the sunshine, I go to the community for a, a sports. The old guys go out, go to the sports center, so they are having sunshine, go to the park. 
even mm -hmm. though they have a very good house already with sunshine. I don't know why they have the problem with the sunshine. They can go out, have an exercise, and go to the community center and have an exercise there, enjoy themselves. After that, that's it. Maybe 10 years, maybe the construction. Or what do you think? The construction would be, it says there's 2026. Yeah, that was 2012, uh, 2030. Yeah, Jason, could you uh, remind them of the, the timeline when you expect construction to be done, yeah. roughly? Uh, well, for the entire site, that's uh, it would be a bit longer because, you know, it, it is three towers. It is three buildings. So that was just the construction, proximate construction schedule for um, the, the first building, which was right. I would hope to start in 2023. Each building maybe takes about two, three years. So the first building, 2026, and then I guess each subsequent building, um, you know, another two, maybe three years for each of the other ones as well. So it would be two plus three plus three, yeah. almost eight years? For the entire development from start yeah. to finish? Yeah, approximately. Oh, so I'm already 10 years here, so that eight years is good. As long as not double the eight years. Okay, well, thank, thanks, Hector. I think it's mostly, um, I don't know if there's anything for anyone to respond to other than that we've got your your feedback similar to the other ones. Um, you're, that you you agree with it and that you don't love that there's noise, but that it's a shorter, you know, five to eight year or 10 year sure. process. Um, and that there's lots, of, that there are other ways that people can get sunshine, if I understood you well, like going to the community center, going out to parks and things like that. Um, so I've got, I got need sunshine well. in so, my apartment. Yeah, yeah, and other, yeah, 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 and other That's people are different. looking for yeah. Others some some are looking for sunshine in the apartment. Others are looking for sunshine in the community and appreciate Ethel that those are two very different kinds of sunshine. Um, that's part of the point of the meeting. Uh, is to, is to that. So I'm going to go to um. So thank you, Hector. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, back to my list, Jamal. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, uh, we can go to your feedback. We got about five more minutes before we start to wrap. Hi, so I'll keep this short. So I grew up in the Toronto Community Housing Project right at uh, Birchmount and Eglinton, and I went to St. Maria Goretti School, so I know the area very well. Um, I support this housing. I support the density. Um, and frankly, I would love to live in a building like this myself. I currently work as a lawyer at TD Bank, so downtown. So this type of housing where I don't have to drive and I could get to downtown really quickly and conveniently would be great. Um, my only comment is that I think to accommodate this many more people, the sidewalks would have to be widened. Um, and I didn't see that in the drawing plan. So I'm hoping that could be addressed. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, Scott, I don't know if that's one spot from, uh, Forek, if you're thinking about the sidewalks as part of the landscape plan, I don't know if that's something you want to respond to. Uh, no response. It, it is a great comment. It's something uh, that we look at. So thanks for that feedback. Yeah. Okay, good. We have at least five more people that have their hands raised since the beginning. So I just wanted to make sure that you capture all of everyone's concern, um, if if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, we're, thanks. For, we're not going to get to everyone, I don't think, but in the meeting. But we have. I will. We will talk about ways that if we don't get to everybody, that we can get to them. We have been working as hard as we can to get through as many people as possible. Okay. Um, I just wanted to quickly uh, uh, talk about two concerns that I have. So, mm -hmm. first of all, the area surrounding Kennedy Station definitely is not pedestrian friendly as of now. With the overpass over the station and all of the, the different uh, parking space and there's no uh, crossing between the tracks, it's, it's causing a lot of issues in the surrounding area. Right? So. In this project right now, I know that in the presentation, you only focus on the development area. There's not much talked about whether there will be new underpass that will be implemented. I would like to learn more about that in terms of the overall uh, neighborhood planning, because right now, because of this pedestrian and friendly list, it's causing a lot of people needing to drive in to the gold train, the, to the gold train station, to the Kennedy station causing all this problem with parking as well right so i understand that you know the main goal is to have a pedestrian friendly area a neighborhood set up here around surrounding this kennedy station hub so what are the plans regarding that i would like to learn more about that so that's my first concern my second concern is 
the um, uh, to create that mixed income area that we want. So currently at 20, 2495 Eglinton. So the, the building that is uh, right next to the Don Montgomery uh, Community Center, that is a public housing already. And also in the surrounding areas, we have a lot of low income apartment rentals that are available. So we want to create this um, mixed income community have that been considered? So I, I wanted to echo back to uh, the point that Ian, uh, the, the other uh, person, I, uh, I, I forgot his first name, sorry. Uh, he mentioned about creating like this mixed income area and not another uh, trouble area where you have high crime rates. So I just wanted to understand, you know, in terms of the, from the planning perspective, have we considered all of the current public housing that is in the area already? How are we Thank addressing you. it? So Thank you. thanks, yep. Thanks, Shirley. So I think maybe the TTC and Metrolink. So Scott from TTC and Metrolink can speak about the connections from Kennedy Station. I, I, I surely you're saying that's not super pedestrian friendly right now. So if if and how you're thinking about that connection, and others from the city can chime in. And on the second point, and and uh, is really how you how the team is considering this a mixed income community in the context of, of there being other lower low income or support uh, low income in the immediate vicinity. Hi there, Scott Haskell, TDC. Just to quickly address the comment about pedestrian unfriendliness, we are we're quite aware of that. We we've we've seen that for forty five years now. How that's a problem around there. Uh, th there should be some improvements when the new Line Five Eglinton, the cross town, opens. But we'll take that away and we'll see what we can do. Whether we have any plans to make any improvements. Okay, so Metrolinks, anything else to add on that in terms of the connection? Uh, just to second what Scott was saying when the. Kennedy station is completed. There will be a bunch of additional enhancements. Uh, I don't have any slides to present to you right now. However, you can go to the crosstown.ca and you can see some renders of what Kennedy station will look like um, and some of the surrounding area. So there will be sidewalk improvements as well as a lot of walking space in that area. Okay, can I also and surely we, we can put we can put that uh, in the, the meeting notes as well, that link, just to so that people don't have to jot that down. Thank you. Ian, can I also add something? I, just, yes. um, just up from our side uh, at Create TO, Shirley, thank you for, for your comment. It's extremely well well noted. Um, and that is definitely something that we have told our consultants that we, we truly need to focus on the public realm and those connections. It has been um, noted by city staff as well that this is really something that we're looking for. And we are in close contact with Metrolink and the TTC to make sure that that interface is working properly between our site and the connections. You know, we we are coming with a lot of density here when we want to make sure that we are all working together. You know, the city create TO, TTC and Metrolink on making sure that, you know, our development fits nicely with um, everything to the south in terms of connectivity. And as you mentioned, crossing over to you know, a, you know, a, a fantastic amenity at the Don Montgomery Community Center. So this is something that just um, for everyone to know, we are really focused on what you just mentioned, uh, mentioned Shirley. So thank you for that. Um, and I'll, I'll just answer the question about uh, the building, Shirley. My name is Salima Raji. I'm Vice President of Development at Creatio. I um, lead the, the portfolio of Housing Now projects for Creatio. I just want to be clear that this project is actually a rental housing development. So um, it is going to be a development that we partner with the developer on, meaning that the developer will own and operate the buildings. They will be private buildings, but they will be mandated to have a component of what we consider workforce housing. Um, so for our working population that will benefit from transit that we know right now during COVID, we have relied so heavily on. Um, and I think that there's a distinction there between this product that we are working on um, to bring forward uh, that there is a large consideration of market housing and then the affordable component uh, that we described earlier that Valesa described earlier is 80% of average market rent uh, relative to the other building typology and, and stock that you that you mentioned. Okay, um, so we're just at time and I do want to talk about next steps. I got, got we got through a, a, at least 2 thirds, if not 3 quarters of the hands. And so we will talk about, um, uh, but I'm sure that there's others who didn't get the hand up yet uh, who also have feedback. So 
Um, I'm just going to start a quick wrap up on discussion of our next steps, and then I'll turn it over to um, uh, to Annalee uh, and Jason for some broader project next steps, and then finally to the councillors uh, for any closing words. Um, so uh, first, I'll say thank you very much for for uh, coming and and for sharing your feedback tonight. And our facilitation team has been like taking lots of detailed notes. We are going to type up a summary and uh, share it with you in draft to make sure that we've accurately documented the discussion, both the feedback that you shared, the questions that you shared, and the question and the answers that were given to those questions. Um, so we're going to do that within a couple of weeks, and we'll we'll email it to you. and And we would love if you could take just a couple of minutes to give it a read and let us know if you think it's a, a fair summary of the discussion that we had. And as Annalie said, um, that is that part, uh, that report is going to be something that helps uh, inform the next steps of the work. So it's uh, very important um, to us that uh, you take uh, that um, chance to give it a read and make sure that it's an accurate summary of the discussion. Um, so I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, uh, other than to say that the presentation and recording of the meeting are going to get posted online uh, within the next day or so. Um, and that you can, uh, a reminder, I said this off the top, but in case others joined late, that you can share any additional feedback up to and including April 30th. So this, uh, surely I know, wanted to get to those other hands that we didn't get a chance to. For those folks that did have a hand up, um, you can still share your feedback by April 30th. Um, you can do that by going to createto.ca slash housing now. And you can also sign up for updates there to, to learn more. And you can also email Jeffrey, whose contact email uh, is, is on that website as well. And we'll, we'll um, We'll make sure that that's also in the meeting summary so that you have many different ways that you can can follow up with us afterwards. So that's it for me. Uh, Annalie, Jason, over to you, and then uh, Councillor uh, Thompson and Councillor Crawford, final words over to you. Um, I'll just leave it to Jason or the councillors. Thanks, Ian, for the chance. Uh, sure, thanks, Annalie. I don't really have uh, too much to add uh, other than to say I think my contact information is also going to be uh, embedded in the presentation that you'll see. So if there are any, you know, further questions, please feel free to reach out to myself. So in terms of our next steps, thank you for the feedback tonight. And we are going to take uh, all of these comments that we've heard tonight into consideration in refining the concept plan uh, in partnership with city staff. And our next uh, big milestone as mentioned is we will be um, taking the site out to market for a partner. Uh, hopefully in May, but uh, the, the most important thing to note is there definitely will be further um, future consultation on this project because it is still early on um, and there has not been a formal planning application made um, and that'll be done once the developer partner comes on board. But as Annalie mentioned earlier, um, they will be also getting the feedback from tonight um, as part of um, as part of their process when they're looking at this site. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I want to thank the residents for coming out uh, to discuss this very important issue. I think that you've highlighted the impact on your concerns with respect to this development on the community. What I'm going to propose is that I'm going to propose that we strike a community working group in order to focus on the details, as we've heard from many residents here, heard from the residents that um, 2460 and also 2466. And we've heard that some people like the proposal and some people don't like the proposal. Uh, this, for the record, is my first time seeing the proposal myself and Councillor Crawford. We did not have a hand in terms of the development of this particular proposal. Uh, there are things that I like about it and there are things that I don't particularly like about it. What I will say for those who are of the view that simply that this should not happen at this site. I will simply say that that is not possible. What is possible is for us to work together as a community to bring forward your concerns and, um, you know, look at reviewing how the, uh, the intensification is what's being proposed to what can be done to address this issue. But I'm proposing that we strike a working group for those who are interested in spending more time and drilling into the proposal that's being presented and to offer um, suggestions in terms of how we can make this better. Part of my concern going forward, if this matter were to go to the LPAT, which is a tribunal that you know, looks at uh, residential development and so on, and you look at the city's own policy, the 2019 growth plan, 
as well as looking at the official plan and looking at the city's um, intention with respect to intensification around subway or subway lines or uh, you know light rail um, rapid transit lines and so on it actually would not support those who are suggesting that we don't have development here we probably would have more things imposed on us and i think that there's an opportunity for us to refine and have discussions what I am concerned about is the comment that was made that, you know, you know, our big uh, next step and or milestone is to take this to market in May. I would like to see before we take this to market in May that there's further consultation with respect to members of the community, because I think that their views are extremely important. And in as much as we will support this in the end uh, as part of a dialogue and discussion, I think that we have to have that, that discussion and, and we have to have obviously alternative options that we take a look at and we can discount some of it and we can agree on what we would want to see here. The concerns we've heard about, you know, shadow impact and so on. Those obviously, Mr. Sinclair, you will take into consideration as well as all of the uh, folks from uh, CREATO and our planning team and so on. And I'm sure the, uh, whoever that developer will be when they come in, if we're able to get it right as a community, and they agree to it, then we will all be very happy with respect to a development that's being proposed. And I know that there's been a tremendous amount of impact uh, on the obvious uh, of the cross town that's taking place. We've heard about the challenges for people moving around and parking and so on. There are a lot of things that we have to discuss. I think before we take this particular matter to a developer to the marketplace in order to get uh, someone to say, we would like to work in partnership with the community with the city. I think there's more community work that needs to be done and I'm uh, prepared to work with members of the community and our city staff in order to get to a solution that accommodates obviously interests, both those of the city, both of the community and those of a potential developer. So I thank you all very much for participating and being engaged because it shows you care about your community. And I think that for those who are opposed, I think that there are opportunities for those who are supportive, there are opportunities. And I think we can come to a, um, a common a ground of support for this application pending the concerns of the community being brought forward. So thank you very much for everyone. And I encourage you to stay safe and healthy th during these very difficult times. And thank you staff and thank you to the team. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, with that, we're gonna, we're gonna end the meeting and uh... You, it may spit you out into a place where you can share feedback right away. If it doesn't, you might have to look at your browser, but if that doesn't work, just go to createto.ca slash housing now, and that, that has all the links. So thank you very much and stay safe and healthy, everybody.